So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Matters in Question seminar series last event of Easter term. I'm Hakan Sandal, a PhD student here at the Center for Gender Studies and the convener of this series. As a reminder, this event is being filmed and hopefully will be up on our website very soon, which is mattersinquestion.co.uk. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we currently have one subscriber, which is, <laughs> which is nice. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Sharmila Parmanand. Uh, she holds a master's degree in gender and development from the University of Melbourne, where she critically examined the effect of access to microcredit on female borrowers' household relations for her thesis. She is currently a PhD candidate in gender studies at the University of Cambridge and is a Gates scholar. Her PhD research investigates the interactions between the anti-trafficking sector and sex workers in the Philippines. Her talk today is of great importance, academically and politically. It is about researching sex work, where she will be sharing with us some of the methodological and ethical challenges she identified. Drawing on her interactions with leaders of the Philippine Sex Workers Collective, and 50 other sex workers in the Philippines, she will address the challenges in adhering to a commitment to treat sex workers as partners in knowledge production, while also critically reflecting upon their realities and navigating academic bureaucracy. I think that her insights will raise challenging questions about methods and methodologies we employ in gender and sexuality studies. So please join me in welcoming Sharmila Parman. Um, I'll try to keep this as informal as possible, uh, maybe talk for 30 to 40 minutes max because I do want space for a chat that's usually where the most productive stuff happens. So the title of my dissertation, I'm in my third year and the write-up stage, is um, Saving Our Sisters, a Critical Inquiry into Sex Trafficking Discourses in the Philippines. Um, the specific focus of this talk is the methodological challenges. So I won't spend that much time talking about the findings and the actual results, except for the major ones. But I really want to talk about the metho methodological journey and how I navigated that. But of course, some background on the, dis on, the, on the research, right? There are two overarching research questions I investigate. One, how do the anti-trafficking sector's truth claims about sex workers in the Philippines compare with sex workers' lived realities? But of course, I'm not treating these as like two categories that are separate from each other. Like, I am comparing them at the same time knowing that anti-trafficking discourses are productive. So the sex workers who are talking to me are also constructed by those discourses. Um, and then second, how are common anti-trafficking interventions, in the case of the Philippines, usually raids and rescue operations or even rehabilitation processes experienced by sex workers? Are they experienced in the way they are intended, for example? And a core data collection method I use, in fact, what I rely on the most for data is uh, partial life history interviews with sex workers. My project is completely qualitative in terms of the data I generate. So I, in, I interact with some quantitative data in my literature review, but it is largely a qualitative project. So a quick background on anti-trafficking in the Philippines. I don't want to dwell on this. I've teased out the elements that I think are going to be essential to understanding the project. The anti-trafficking law was enacted in 2003. The definition of trafficking is quite complex, so I'm just going to distill it for this talk. So it basically refers to uh, recruiting or moving or hiring people using force, uh, deception, or even abuse of vulnerability, which is quite a vague term, uh, for purposes of exploitation. And prostitution can be understood to be one of those exploitative things. So the law lends itself to the interpretation that women in prostitution are victims. On the other hand, we also still have in the Philippines a revised penal code that criminalizes prostitution. So there is a weird tension in our law. And in a way, this tension kind of mirrors how, women are, how prostitutes are seen in Philippine society as both criminals and victims. The official position of the Philippine Commission on Women, uh, which plays an important role in the anti-trafficking sector, is that sex work is violence against women, and that there is no agency in sex work because this agency is entirely undermined by poverty and desperation. This view is endorsed by the anti-trafficking sector after it was proposed to them by the Philippine Commission on Women. 
What are some of the key features of the anti-trafficking sector in the Philippines and why do I think it's important to study them and also critique them? So the anti-trafficking sector revolves around the Inter-Agency Council Against Trafficking, which was created in 2003 uh, with a mandate to oversee the implementation of the anti-trafficking law. Some of the unique things about the Inter-Agency Council is that it's a hybrid model, so its members come from state agencies but also appointed nonprofit organizations. And it's heralded as a, as a global best practice because it you know, institutionalized cooperation, institutionalizes cooperation from between civil society and the state, which people think is valuable in fighting trafficking. Um, at the same time, I do critique this structure and say that given the way it's set up, where nonprofit organizations need to get voted in to secure their appointments, and the people voting on them are state agencies. So they kind of are reliant on the approval of these state agencies, which in a way serves as a disciplinary practice, because then it becomes very hard for them to overtly contradict uh, what these state agencies are saying, even if there is some space for conversation, but that, that structure um, circumscribes like what can and can't be done. Um, so, yeah, another key feature of anti-trafficking in the Philippines is very strong church involvement. Uh, and US the U.S. funding is still the predominant uh, funding source, although that's starting to diversify now. One thing to keep in mind about U.S. funding, this is well documented, is that any U.S. federal funds that go to foreign projects and programs or foreign NGOs, or even U.S. NGOs operating in foreign countries, is that especially when it's going to anti-trafficking or HIV prevention, is that these NGOs must sign an anti-prostitution pledge. So none of this funding can go to uh, endorsing prostitution. It must that, that the organization must always demonstrate a position against the legalization of prostitution, and that's a that's a dominant funder in the anti-trafficking space, right? Some of the key interventions include rescue operations and raids on commercial sex establishments like bars, brothels, or even just streets, uh, rehabilitation so where people are brought into shelters uh, and uh, allowed to heal and, and are transformed and reintegrated into society. have a few things to say about that in a bit. Uh, emphasis on, on prosecution, because this is a metric that is used in the U.S. Trafficking per uh, Persons Report. This is how they rank countries. How well do you prosecute? Um, trafficking cases, how many convictions have been handed down, and lots of awareness and advocacy campaigns, but not very strong quality control measures over how these awareness and advocacy campaigns are run. Philippines are also noteworthy because we hold a tier one ranking in the US uh, Department of State Trafficking in Persons Report, which is the gold standard in assessing anti-trafficking efforts, right? So by that means, we're kind of like a role model in the region, and this is a point of pride of the Philippine government. So other governments send their officials to go on study tours to learn what we're doing well. And our government officials also go overseas and teach other countries our best practices. So there really is a need to critique this site of power and authority. Um, all right, a quick uh, description of my intellectual journey. How did I end up here? I actually used to work in the trafficking in a fairly central role. Um, and in 2014, when I was de delivering a lecture to social workers about our great rehabilitation and rescue operations, um, I was one of the guests. Another guest was a guest relations officer. So in the Philippines, that's kind of like a euphemism for someone who engages in sex work, right? <laughs> so I spoke about our, our interventions quite proudly. And when I sat down, uh, this woman comes up and speaks, and she's quite hostile towards me, and she starts her speech with, if only people listen to us first before judging us and telling us what to do with our lives. So at that point, like this is half a decade ago, I'm like quite baffled at this hostility. I'm like, why does this woman hate me? I'm like trying to help her. <laughs> but that did, like that did trigger a reflection. I'm like, am I know I haven't actually spoken to her. This is fair. <laughs> and this kind of made me a lot more critical of the anti-trafficking ecosystem and the environment I was working with. So some of the things that start that I start, that started registering more with me is are so first the discursive privilege that's accorded uh, trafficking survivors and abolitionist organizations and I, I do think trafficking is real and trafficking survivors definitely deserve to be heard in front in fact they should be front and center when we think about how to design interventions um, 
at the same time, they cannot be speaking, cannot be considered to be speaking for the entire spectrum of people who have been involved in like prostitution. So they can't be there at the exclusion of another group, which is what is happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. I also think it is important to interrogate the transactional nature of the relationships between survivors and the abolitionist organizations who shelter them and who rescue them and on whom they are dependent for aid and security. And in my chats with some of these people who do identify as survivors, I don't really talk about that here because I just want to talk about the sex workers, but I do talk to survivors as well. This is something they say, that there is implicit or explicit pressure to frame their stories in a certain way to suit the narrative that's convenient for their funders or their organizations that are seeking funding. So this is an entire chapter in my dissertation, but I think this needs to be interrogated more. So that made me a bit uncomfortable other sources of discomfort were in my regular encounters and interactions with the police, and you, we would hear things like, why don't we just raid this club anyway? We don't have a clear ID and like a trafficking victim here, there's no child in the club, but it would be good to shake them up anyway because they have sex workers. So there seemed to be a bit of a conflation of anti-trafficking with anti-sex work. And I mean, this is something that is also cited even in a US trafficking persons report. The next thing that made me like sl slightly uncomfortable was um, in some of the manuals for social workers, and not the government issued ones, but those by accredited partners or nonprofit organizations who also work with victims. Um, you see things like prostitutes are the hardest intakes. You first need to convince them that they are victims. I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure that this is how I would go about it. I also think that the anti trafficking sector has had a very different approach to sex work versus other forms of precarious work, such as domestic work and factory work. So in the context of the Philippines, the realistic alternatives for these women are dom work or domestic work or factory work, right? And the way we've dealt with domestic workers is we've recognized that they are a vulnerable sector. At the same time, we haven't tried to ban them. Like We've tried to regulate the sector in a way that involves stakeholders meaningfully participating in policy formation. So we actually help domestic workers organize and represent themselves in these meetings with trade unions and the government. So I was just like very baffled by the difference in how sex work is being approached and how domestic work is being approached. I mean, I do recognize that there's not much space to discuss that here that sex work is embedded in a, in a colonial history as well. The American basis in the Philippines and the fact that we're a former colony does complicate that conversation. Um, but yes, th this was baffling to me. And finally, the idea of rehabilitation as an ideological project, like a very clear project of creating virtuous women in the moral neoliberal economy. So it's not like we are saying, we have rescued you, here is money, I hope you are well. What we are saying is we have rescued you, we will now train you to be hairdressers, <laughs> to bake cookies or make jam, or to sew, and to do all sorts of, or to work as domestic workers which are occupations that are labor intensive, low wage, very dignified and decent work. At the same time, why are they necessarily superior to sex work? And many of the women I've spoken to who've been rescued say they earn more from sex work and sex, their hours in sex work are far more flexible. So there seems to be like some disciplinary mechanism at play here as well. So anyway, after all these doubts kicked in, my conclusion was sex workers have been excluded from these conversations they should play a central role in these conversations. And so here we are. So I applied to do this. So in walking you through my methodological journey today, I want to make my starting points explicit. I want to make the challenges explicit, talk through how I resolved them. I don't think I've resolved all of them yet, or ever. Um, so I'm just gonna have to be honest about the limitations as well. And in hindsight, what I could have done better perhaps and just a quick note on language. So I, I just asked the women I interviewed what they preferred to be called. Uh, most of them preferred to be called sex worker. Um, those who identify as trafficking victims, then I call as women in prostitution or trafficking victims because that's, that's what they want to be called. The default term in my work is sex worker. Um, all right, so starting points. The exclusion of sex workers from uh, important policy conversations is a form of epistemic injustice. So we have a credibility economy and some people are seen as having credibility deficits just by virtue of who they are. And one popular strain of reasoning that excludes sex workers is that they suffer from a false consciousness, 
they don't really know what their real interests are, or they come from such psychologically damaged backgrounds, or the work is so violent and damaging that somehow they are incapable now of making a rational assessment of what their interests are, which is something I reject and do explicitly engage with in my work. So I don't think I should be excluded from these conversations, but especially not on that basis. Second, that anti-trafficking discourse and interventions in the Philippines are a result of unequal and hierarchical social relationships. So you have specific actors in specific relationships with each other, and I also do a bit of following the money, mm -hmm. um, and therefore we produce like this version of reality. Um, but the gap here is we haven't listened to the voices from below. So it's important to listen to sex workers. Now, the group that I reached out to is called the Philippine Sex Workers Collective. I will say very brief things about them. Um, they're not a registered organization because of the criminal nature of sex work in the Philippines. So it's hard to register. It is difficult for them to publicly disclose their identities, but they do so in semi-public, semi-private settings like consultations or meetings. Uh, they common, so their most common entry point to policy conversations now is in the um, HIV AIDS prevention space. Um, they've been generally excluded from other spaces. Uh, obviously not being registered means not really being able to access funding because you're competing with or orgs that are far more well organized um, who then purport to speak for them. <laughs> but um, so this lack of access of, of funding to funding means a lot of their members end up doing activist labor for free and this is hard to sustain so there's a high turnover in the organization so the member membership base is quite loose and even the leadership structure has high turnover. So these are the challenges um, with them, but they do exist, they have a social media presence, and they have some informal laws and, and organizational structure. So I reached out to them, introduced myself, explained my background, and said I wanted to get to know more, get to know them more, and get to understand sex work more. Obviously their first response was, why will we trust you? Which is very fair. Which then leads me to a discussion of the relationship between academics and sex workers. They've very directly told me we don't trust academics. And some of the reasons they've given me are academics are extractive. You mine us for data, you profit from this data professionally, you get grants, you get fancy degrees, and we're still here. And I'm like, this is fair, right? In some cases, academics have distorted their reality to fit preconceived notions about sex work. So you confide in academics about, for example, abuses you suffer at the hands of clients, and this information is then weaponized to justify the criminalization of sex work, when in fact, perhaps the context of that was we would be safer if we weren't criminalized in the first place, because then we would have remedies against our clients, right? So they don't have control over how the information is used. Some academics don't care about privacy or security. So recently, I've seen an article published about strategies that sex workers do to evade, like police, I don't know, brutality or surveillance, and I'm like, do not publish that information because you are endangering people, right? But that's a fair concern, and especially under the police state of Duterte, where the police has been given immense power, this is a very val valid concern. Next thing is they're stuck, we don't need savings. Some of you are coming in here with a perspective of pity or like wanting to treat us as lab rats and trying to understand how you can improve our lives, but th that's not what we need, which is again fair. Another concern they have is that academics take platforms that belong to them and speak for them instead, which is a concern I too have uh, and is something that I constantly negotiate with a collective because I do not want to take space from them as much as possible. So in the end, after this constant back and forth and myself trying to prove my worthiness, they were like, we will be happy to grant your request, but uh, make sure that this is not construed as a benevolent action on your part to help or aid us. You must treat us as partners in this collaboration. I still have that email. I look at it quite regularly and I'm like, yeah, this is a fair request. So the starting point has to be that the collective is a partner in knowledge production here. Now, how do I navigate all these commitments? What does it mean to treat sex workers as partners in knowledge production? What does it mean to regard them as authoritative knowers? At the same time, how do I preserve space for critical and academic reflection? Because I still need to be critical of the people I interview. How do I secure access to the community? And assuming I have specific gatekeepers, what are the implications of having those gatekeepers? And if there are limitations, how do I mitigate against those limitations? 
how do I account for my own subject position and how might this affect my interactions with sex workers and my engagement with the issue? How do I secure informed and meaningful consent? How am I going to be more accountable with all this information that I've gotten? A really difficult questions. I have partial answers that I will share, but they are ongoing questions. So just a quick overview of the data collection method. I did partial life history interviews with uh, leaders of the collective, so there are about six of them, and 50 other unaffiliated sex workers in Metro Manila. Um, so I did the interviews in a mix of English and Filipino, which I also speak and understand. Um, so I issued a call for interviews that was circulated by the collective within their networks. But I was not allowed to approach the sex workers myself, which is fair, because that would be outing them and making them uncomfortable. So I had to wait for interested parties to reach out either to the collective or then to be referred to me or to me directly because I put my contact information down. And surprisingly, several actually did. Uh, 50 actually did. Um, I tried my best and mostly succeeded at focusing on street and establishment-based sex workers. Mostly street workers, some establishment-based sex workers. They are, th we've heard the refrain, right? They're theoretically the most vulnerable in terms of uh, income, they earn the less, the least, and in terms of safety because of exposure to the police or to violent clients with no like institution that's really protecting them. But actually, part of their vulnerability, especially in a conservative country, the Philippines predominantly Catholic, is not just all these things, but the fact that they are seen as ostensibly selling sex, as opposed to other sex workers who kind of, there are different layers to what's happening, like it can be argued that what they are selling is a, are more erotic services or more emotional intimacy. While there might be sex involved, it's not purely or only about sex. In some cases, the sex part is really downplayed. But that's less the case with street-based workers, where it's like very clear and direct that this is about selling sex, which also then increases the stigma against them in the same way that doesn't happen for, say, higher class escorts or call girls, also, although those are also still stigmatized. And to mitigate self-selection, so I recognize that the collective is explicitly political, but this might not be true of every sex worker in the Philippines. Um, so what I did was I used the snowball sampling method. So whoever I managed to reach through the collective, I was like, do you have friends? Do you have friends of friends who not, don't know about the collective who might still be willing to chat with me? Please make them reach out. So in the end, more than half of my interviewees were actually not secured directly through the collective, but through a snowball sampling method, just to mitigate against like self-selection. Um, all right, so what was the research relationship like with the Philippine Sex Workers Collective. So I was very upfront and transparent about the research framework and aims, so no holds barred. They know everything about the research, including like what the funding situation is like and all of that. Consult them when drafting the questionnaire, um, and I did pilot interviews with them. So when I asked certain questions and they were like, that's a really bad question, <laughs> or that's not how you should be phrasing that question because no one will tell you anything. So these were useful. Um, consulted them on navigating issues such as compensating interviewees because from their perspective like I should have paid people a lot more for their time because they were like this is labor and I'm like yes but that also is a perverse incentive right like and so we had to like talk this through and negotiate like an acceptable amount dealing with distress during interviews um, like which organizations were they comfortable with me tapping in case this was necessary it never became necessary uh, ensuring participant safety, like where to hold the interview. So Cambridge was not okay with me holding interviews in houses of people. So what suggested spots? Because they are in a better position to be aware of surveillance risks and things like that. Um, I committed to allowing them to use my research findings for their advocacy campaigns on sex worker safety and human rights with a promise that these findings are represented like fairly and correctly. Um, I've committed to assisting in these campaigns, so I've actually like reviewed their grant applications, made some suggestions, uh, helped them with media engagements, and connecting them with my own media contacts, uh, and any creative work they might want to do. So they want to produce like a play and like a book of sex worker stories that's more literary, not really academic. And I'm like, yep, I'm happy to help you with this and offer publication support um, as a way of just giving back. 
Um, I've allowed them to review major claims I made in my dissertation and to make suggestions, but all final decisions are mine. So if we disagree and they're like, this is why we disagree, I get to take that into consideration, but in the end, I will be deciding, and, and I made this very clear to them. Um, also, a commitment to protecting their privacy. Now, securing consent uh, for the interviewees. So let them choose the venues. I explain the research project to them and emphasize their right to refuse to participate or to answer specific questions and to review their answers and to withdraw their participation after the interview with no obligation to provide an explanation. And I provided a written version of this information sheet in Tagalog. I also discussed my background with them. Um, and to some of them, at first, when I said I used to work in anti-trafficking, which I think was important to disclose uh, because of the violence that they've experienced under this sector, initially they were like, uh, oh. And their first question was, are you working with the police? At which point I'm like, nope, nothing will be disclosed to the police. I was honest that I also was interviewing uh, members of the anti-trafficking sector and the police for the project. So I was like, I'm also interviewing them, but if they ask me anything about you, they will get nothing. <laughs> I'm not going to disclose locations, I'm not going to disclose names. If you want me to bring up specific complaints, I can do that, but otherwise they will get nothing from me. Uh, and, and I've honored that commitment. Um, also, honesty in terms of what they can expect from the research, which I found to be one of the hardest parts of the conversation. Because I was like, look, I can't promise any material change in your life situation. I can promise that I am interested in your stories and will try to represent them correctly and how I understand them correctly. And I will share a copy of my work in a language that's accessible to you if you're interested, but I can't promise anything beyond this. Which most of them were actually fine with. And in fact, some of them said they expected this to be just another research project where they answer a survey they did not expect the questions to be as meaningful or as in-depth about their lives and about mundane things. So they seemed to appreciate just the, the fact that this exercise happened seemed to be valuable. And then obviously an assurance of privacy and data anonymization. I allowed some of them to do the interviews in groups, so those who weren't very comfortable speaking to me one-on-one. -on -one. And an option to not record the interviews, but I, I had them go over like the transcripts. So the interview process, these were some of the questions I asked. So I started with very basic ones. Where do you live? What are your family arrangements? Um, and their dependents. So many of them were supporting children or um, their parents and their relationship situation. So more than half of them had multiple partners. So not in what, not at, this, at any given time, but like, so Philippines doesn't allow divorce. Um, but as any, this is fairly well documented that the middle and lower income classes, no, nuptial norms are just a lot more flexible. So people just informally separate and then like begin new relationships. So a lot of them had uh, children by different partners as well. Um, and so these things were established in the beginning and then eventually the ways in which they engaged in sex work, so how much they earned and whether they had pimps. I, should, I will be changing this term to third parties because an editor has alerted me to the racially charged nature of the term, so I will just be saying uh, third parties from now on, um, and their relationships with them and their financial arrangement, so the age in which they first engaged in it, and the circumstances behind it, and their reasons for continuing to do so. This bit is really important, because in the anti-trafficking sector, there's a very static conception of when people entered the sex work, so they were like, you were forced when you entered, thus there is a trafficking situation. But what happens in a situation where someone is no longer forced, they could leave, but they choose to continue on in sex work, or they leave for a while and they go back in. What is that now? How do we make sense of that? Our current frameworks don't quite like cover that, right? Um, their awareness of the legal and policy dimensions of their work. So I actually was like, have you ever heard of the term trafficking and how do you understand this term? Most of them understood it to apply to children. They didn't even realize that it applied to adults. And incidentally though, many of them have experienced being rescued but they use the term rescue and arrest interchangeably, which is quite telling. Um, so their own reflections on their work and their self-representation of their work to other people. I also asked about their support systems, possible experiences of violence and abuse, and that collective actually advised me in this case to phrase my question as, have you or anyone close to you experienced, just in case they weren't comfortable disclosing uh, about themselves. And then, uh, 
more specific questions about rate and rescue operations. So, so this is like the questionnaire flow. It was quite open-ended. There's a lot of space for them to add more things. And I too like asked more questions if I thought it would be useful based on what they were telling me. Now, it was also very important for me to keep in mind the political moment uh, around us, uh, around the interview that we are surrounded by and also that shapes my interviewees, right? And in fact, the impetus for this actually came from one of the leaders of the collective. So he, we, he and I had a conversation about um, how sex workers are commonly depicted in mainstream media and why we have all of these like sob stories of victims and self-sacrificing mothers and like, you know, how they explicitly claim that they wish they, they, they wish they never had to do this, but they're doing this. Like, why is the portrayal so, I guess, why is the portrayal so um, homogenous was my question. And his answer to me was, in a world where selling sex is seen as dirty and immoral, what do you really expect us to say when we are asked about our work? Um, who is going to admit to you that we enjoyed it? And we just tell people what we think they want to hear from us, right? And it's easier to say, we desperately need the money to feed our families or that we were tricked into this than to admit that it is convenient and involves less work and we are tired of judgment and we will avoid it if we can. And I was like, this is fair. I am interviewing a stigmatized population. So this is something to keep in mind. And so in terms of making sense of the interviews then, how did I conceive of this whole thing? I realized I'm not making sense of sex work. I am making sense of how the sex workers I spoke to made sense of their world. So I treat their interviews as texts. I don't think the interviews like reveal inner truths or completely accurate like realities. The interviews themselves are self-presentations too. Um, they tell me what they want me to hear or what they are willing to tell me. I, and I recognize there are things they might not be willing to tell me. Uh, they are also performative. Um, they construct a certain image of themselves that they want to present. Um, and uh, they are also a way by which the sex workers I speak to make meaning because the specific things they remember, the specific narratives they weave based on those things are also a way for them to make sense of their world, right? So while keeping that in mind, I was also looking at sub subjectivation. So recognizing that they, as I keep saying, they are uh, constructed by how they are thought of and spoken about um, and these choices and decisions that they make within their oppressive context. So obviously I take what they say and regard it as authoritative and listen to it and note it down. At the same time, I also noted slippages, tensions, silences, gaps, things that they did not want to answer. Um, and I also tracked like the temperature of the interview, um, the trust building across the interview process. So a lot of times, they would say more things towards the end, or they would address a previous question at the end of the interview, but when I asked the question at that point, they weren't really saying that much. Or they just volunteer so much information in the end. Um, and they were also tracking my reactions. I have an example for that later on. So all of these things I tried to take note of. Um, so, like when I started reflecting on questions of agency in sex work, and this is a really complex uh, chapter, I don't want to go into details, just the part that's relevant to methodology. S suffice to say that my conclusions are, it's very different from the assumptions of the anti-trafficking sector, and that definitely agency is being exercised in the same way, at least, as other precarious work situations. I also challenge the metrics that are used to evaluate agency in the first place. So what did I get from most of them? Most of them were either single mothers or have been single for a significant period of time. The higher, the higher hourly rates they earned in sex work and the flexible hours were an important factor in choosing to engage in sex work. This is a common response. Suspiciously common. <laughs> Almost like a hymn that all of them were singing. That's probably true. Like I, I don't doubt it is, it is true. However, in offhand comments, so the more jokey parts of the interviews or when they're bantering with each other, they never explicitly uh, state this as a reason for engaging in sex work. But there would be comments like, um, to the effect of enjoying the material benefits of engaging in sex work and the gifts from clients, to the effect of 
being flattered by the attention uh, and feeling attractive and prized. So like interesting quote to be like, it didn't last more than three seconds because my beauty was so powerful. <laughs> so things like that. Um, there is a sense of pride in that, right? So one of them started cracking jokes about being too pretty to scrub toilets. And then she looked at me and everyone in the group looked at me. And I think they were waiting to see how I would react, like if I would approve or disapprove. So I just laughed. I mean, it was all so funny. <laughs> and then afterwards, they all like started participating in this joke. And there seemed to be some amount of derision, actually, towards domestic work um, and like manual labor. And they seemed to like think of sex work as more elevated in relation to those things. Or they're like, look at this age. You need to be smart. Like you can't be stupid. You're not pretty forever. Like I have a thing that they need. <laughs> I'm going to. I want to give it to them for free. Kind of like an insinuation that they're actually smarter than some other people in the same situation. So, so these are never like volunteered in a direct as, as a direct answer to a question. But they come up as comments interspersed in other chats, right? Now. I'm like taking a step back and going, what do I do with this, with this information? And I'm like, look, the stigma against sex work may require sex workers to justify their work by demonstrating virtue in other ways, such as by demonstrating that they are good mothers. And this is important, of course. But as the collective leaders themselves like prompted me to think about, they have no meaningful social incentives to suggest that their work can be personally rewarding. And yet they do. And so that's important and that's noteworthy. I mean, another interesting incident was that there were two friends, I was interviewing them, they were quite young. Uh, and in the middle of the interview, one of the clients started messaging like one of the women, so one of her regulars. She was giggling and like messaging him back. And the other one starts teasing her and going, oh, you're gonna have money for better braces next week. <laughs> and she was like, and this? So pointing to her really nice phone. And I'm like, so yes, motherhood is definitely a fact, everybody. He's not the entire transcript. Right? Um, and then some other reflections are, um, so this one I think is fairly expected. Most experienced more abuse by the police than by their clients or third parties. So in terms of who they constructed as threats, it was quite telling. It is not the third parties, it is the police. In fact, there are two interesting anecdotes. They're not exciting, they're actually quite depressing. So one, the more uplifting one was they said, especially the street-based ones, that the pimps also have to compete for sex workers. Mm -hmm. So they also have the ability to discard pimps who are being too exploitative or asking for too much money or who are not effective at delivering clients or screening clients. So they're like, look, yes, the pimps have power over us, but we also get to discard and they also need our money because they're poor too. So that was interesting. The next is in terms of the police and like this micro economy of bribes, so it's literally turned into a market where some of them just hand deliver their bribe money to the police stations so that they don't get harassed or raided or arrested. Um, and in some ways, the police sometimes pit the sex workers against each other because those who don't pay bribes are then seen as a threat to that entire location because then you could all suffer from raids. So some of the women who do pay the bribes then end up like doing things like demeaning the sex workers who don't pay bribes to clients and going, hey, don't go with her. Just go with me because she has an STI or things like that. But like this repressive system is not inherent in sex work. It is a result of the institutional political economy around it, of it being illegal and the police having a lot of power over them. The next thing is um, the different moral worlds that they had towards sex. So some of them did feel that selling sex was immoral, but they had to do it. And some of them were like, no, it's not, or I'm ambivalent about this. But I did pay attention to practices of social distancing. So how they justify their work vis-a-vis -vis other women. So some of them were like, oh, no, 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 I, I only sell sex when it's a regular. Like after like meeting this client on a regular basis, and then there's some emotional attachment. Some of them are like, nah, <laughs> first instance is fine. Some of them are like, I really want to leave this. Uh, and I just do it less frequently now, depending on how the gravity of the need. Um, and some of them have complained that some of their friends who were sex workers who had found other jobs or who had exited, just don't pretend to know, just pretend not to know them anymore, and just like turn their back on on the community. So even within the community, there are these practices of like virtue signaling still. Um, they are 
simultaneously proud and ashamed of the work. So common thing I hear is I have brought shame upon my family. At the same time, I also quite hear from the same people, we are better than corrupt cops and, cops and politicians, and this is clean work. Um, in Philippines, really Catholic. Most of the sex workers I interview identify as Catholic. So while their priests regularly condemn the work that they do, they still go to mass, and they negotiated this by, by saying, yeah, it's a sin, but God forgives me. So it's like using one part of theology against other types of theology. And so like I asked myself, where does this stigma really come from? And is it actually as inherent? Is the work really as inherently degrading as it is seen in the anti-trafficking sector or from some femi in some feminist scholarship? Or might this stigma be a result of like external stigma that is then internalized? Is a thing I need to like work through a bit more. Um, but yes, these are some ways I have tried to simultaneously treat them as authorities, especially because my work is already a reaction to them being excluded. But at the same time, not patronizing them and not taking what they say literally, like still putting it into context and still being critical of them, even as I regard them as like authorities. And there will be parts in the paper where I might falter in doing this, but at least just being guided by that consciousness. Okay, this is it really for my end. I'm happy to chat, or like if you have any similar things you want to share in your own work, I think the group would benefit from that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.